How to make tin foil hat. Ladies and gents, esteemed theorists of the internet, my name is not Pridium and you never heard it from me. And welcome to the most bizarre conspiracy theories in Survivor. Survivor has been around for a while now and throughout the years, a mythos has formed around the series. Because we only get to see so much footage, sometimes you start to hear rumors, rumblings of happenings behind the scenes. And then you chuckle to yourself and think, how do people believe this kind of stuff? Well, here's how. Number five. Superfans expected this theory, and here it is. The bottle twist of season 13, Survivor Cook Islands. In a season that started out divided by race, eventually we found ourselves at episode 9 at the final 12 of the season with a jumbled up cast of players. The theory begins to manifest itself here, as we see a mutiny twist pop up where players can switch to the other tribe if they want, but they only have 10 seconds to make their decision. Two of the original Raro players, Candace and Penner, mutiny to the other tribe to join their original Raro alliance and hold the numbers, leaving four players behind, Yule, Ozzy, Becky, and Sundra. This suddenly created a very lopsided division with the numbers where one tribe, the Raro tribe, now had eight people, meanwhile the abandoned I2 tribe only had four. Not only were these four players severely outnumbered, but they were also likable and easy to root for. And now they were major underdogs. I smell a comeback. So, the underdogs won the next immunity challenge, partially thanks to a clever hack, and in the following episode, a new twist was introduced that seemed a bit odd. At the final 11 immunity challenge, a bottle with a note was introduced, and whichever tribe lost the challenge would have to take the bottle to tribal council and open it up after they voted somebody out. We saw the large, dominant Raro tribe go on to lose, and then go to tribal council, vote out Rebecca, and then they open the bottle to read the note. And what did it say? You've just voted out one member of your tribe. You will now vote out another. That's not fun. Because of this twist, they then voted out another player right away, Jenny, and this was kind of weird. Jenny had no time to plan for this, and if you take a step back, it's also now reducing the Raro tribe down to five players against the I2's four. Suddenly it went from eight to four to five to four. Again, never has this ever happened. And what if I2, the four person tribe, had lost that challenge with the bottle? Would they really be reduced to just two members? And so, the conspiracy was born. The conspiracy went that if the I2-4 had lost that challenge, the producers would give them a different bottle with a different note that would be much less damaging to them. Perhaps they wouldn't vote someone out, or it would just send someone to Exile Island or whatever. It's pretty clear why the producers would want the I2s to stick together from a narrative standpoint. They were the underdogs and outnumbered. With so many days left in the season, a double boot was going to be necessary at some point. The reality of this conspiracy is that there is no hard evidence to counter these claims. But we can use logic. After checking the tapes, I noticed that there was only one bottle next to probes at the challenge, and the same bottle was opened by Raro at the tribal council. The simplest answer is that there was only ever one bottle. So then, Peridium, are you saying the producers would chance it on the I24 winning that challenge? Yeah, I am. Here's the deal. The producers knew how physically strong the I24 were. Heck, they had Ozzy. They knew what the challenge would be ahead of time, and it's not out of the realm of possibility for them to take a gamble on a likely outcome. We've seen this on Big Brother. BB13 Final 6 veto anyone? If you really just think about it, if I2 loses and votes out two people, they're not really in any worse shape than they already were, but if they win with this bottle twist in play, there is major upside, especially given Yule had the super idol in his pocket. Not to mention just three seasons prior in Palau, the producers didn't seem to have a problem narratively with the Oolong tribe decimating itself down to just one person. It's not unforeseen. And even regardless of the race twist, or the current optics of the season at the time the bottle was introduced, or what the showrunners may or may not have thought about all that, I think there being only one bottle makes sense and isn't far-fetched at all. I think what's more likely is what we've seen already. I think the producers did what we have seen before. They knew the odds and they took the risk. Still a bad twist though, really don't care for it. You will not, however, leave empty-handed. The losing tribe will take back to camp with them this bottle. Inside it is a note. I'm interested to hear what's in that bottle. I have this feeling of like dread, like I don't want to open it, I don't want to know, because it's going to be something really bad, but who knows. Number four. 
The fourth strangest conspiracy theory takes us eight seasons ahead to season 21, Survivor Nicaragua, and it can best be described as what the superfan community has dubbed it, Mortgage Gate. This conspiracy posits that Sash, the third place finalist, lost the season with zero votes to his name, not because the jury didn't vote for him, but because the jury couldn't vote for him. They weren't allowed to. Why is that? According to the theory, Sash offered to pay off another player's mortgage if said player, after they were voted out and joined the rest of the jury, would lobby the jury to vote for Sash to win. However, within the rules of Survivor, this tactic is considered illegal and not allowed. You can't split the money, you can't pay people off, you can't use the grand prize in any way to gain an advantage. Apparently, Sash attempted to make this deal with Jane, who instead exposed Sash to the producers with what he was doing, and according to the theory, even though Jane would later get voted out, the producers then chose to punish him for breaking the rules by barring the jury from voting for him. And thus, he received zero votes. Okay, let's clear this up and provide some context. Going back three rounds prior to the final six in episode 14, Sash and his alliance turned on Jane and she wasn't happy about it. Later that night at the tribal council, Jane cast her sole vote for Sash, and in Jane's voting confessional, she said, you can lie all you want to, and then the clip was cut off. It was edited to abruptly end. <clears throat> you can lie all you want to. What was Jane referring to Sash lying about? For many years, the Survivor producers would upload the unedited voting confessionals online for fans to watch the players explain their votes in real time. In a regular edited episode, we usually hear maybe one or two players utter a few words. Most players don't get shown saying anything, but in these unedited videos, we saw everything. Well, until Jane's. And then, for whatever reason, after the premiere episode of the following season, 22 Redemption Island, these unedited voting confessionals went away for good. You can check the Survivor Wiki if you want, and you will notice the confessionals slim down in number by a lot every episode after that one. You need to be gone. Actually, I'm gonna keep talking. We need to flush the idol off, idol off, so. I don't know exactly why, after years and years of showing us these unedited confessionals, the producers stopped sharing them, but go figure, it was only two episodes after the Jane and Sash fiasco went down. Presumably because both Jane and Sash aired their dirty laundry when they cast their vote for each other, and the producers didn't want this to make air. You're a classy Southern lady, but what you pulled today at camp and that tribal is utterly disgusting. Marty, a juror on the season, went on to say postseason that the jury weren't barred from voting for Sash, they just didn't respect his game enough to write his name down. And ultimately, based on everything I've heard from the cast postseason, I believe this to be the case. I do believe Jane accused Sash of this deal, but Sash denies that he made the deal, and because we have no footage of it and nobody else can corroborate it, all we have left to stew on is hearsay. After over two decades of the show and hundreds of deep dives and postseason interviews, I tend to just trust my gut here, and I think, much like most of these theories, that Occam's razor is in play, and the simplest answer is the most likely one. It was he said, she said, Jane was voted out, and Sash just didn't get any votes, a result we see all the time. Well, I just wanna make sure we're still four people. Somebody has to go tonight, it's hard. The truth is, the three of us think that you can beat all of us for the million dollars oh, yeah. at the end. I told Sash, don't even look at me. And if he wants to try to compare me to his mama, I didn't raise my daughter to be a liar and a cutthroat, but she raised a damn liar. Number three. Now this is an amusing one. <laughs> On night 30 of season 16, Survivor Micronesia, three players, James, Alexis, and Eric, stumbled upon a production camp at night and stole some Gatorade and peanut butter. But they got caught in the process, or so I've heard, and somehow James sliced his finger open, Alexis tripped and hurt her knee, and Eric, well, I guess nothing happened to Eric. 
yet. The conspiracy says that because the producers caught these three players sneaking into the producer's camp and took some food, they were then eliminated from the game in seventh, sixth, and fifth place back to back to back. James was surprisingly medically evacuated the next day, Alexis was blindsided by an idol at the next tribal council in the same episode, and Eric decided to give up his immunity necklace at the final five to another player, which caused him to get voted out. One of the most bizarre eliminations we have ever seen. That's the theory, anyway. They were all strangely punished. As if starving for over a month wasn't punishment enough. Now straight up, I don't buy this theory at all. I do believe the producer's camp story, and it kind of explains what happened to James and Alexis randomly getting hurt. If you rewatch episode 11, right before the tribes head to tribal council, you can see that James doesn't have an injury or a bandage around his finger. But then he arrives at tribal council, and there's this mysterious bandage. Where did that come from? Then, at the beginning of episode 12, when the tribe gets back to camp, we see Alexis talking about her messed up knee. She says that she tripped in the dark. It's kind of convenient that both players have an injury in the same time frame and neither of these moments are caught on camera. But James's injury is severe. It's right at the joint of his finger and I truly, truly do not believe the doctors would mess around with what we see here. If it got worse, it could cause serious problems for him and because of that, James is later medically evacuated in the same episode, not long after the injury occurs. To add fuel to the fire, Alexis is later blindsided in the same episode when Amanda plays an idol against her, but the funny thing here is that we, ooh, we never saw Amanda find the idol at all. We know where it was hidden underneath the tribe flag, but the producers decided in an uncommon editing technique to not show us her finding it. It's a simple change of narrative in the story, something I wish the producers would do more often, surprise the audience with these idol finds, and I think they just chose to leave us, the audience, hanging to find out if she found the idol. Also, not to mention, based on the absolutely logical tribe dynamics, Eric was the target here, he just happened to win immunity. And then, yeah, speaking of Eric, and the moment where he gave up his immunity at the final five, that has been covered extensively over the years, potentially the most reported moment in Survivor history, with all five players involved walking us through the entire episode. No way do I even care to entertain this moment being anything other than what it's been billed as. Eric wasn't punished for drinking the producer's Gatorade. Eric was punished for drinking the women's Kool-Aid. Well, after back-to-back -back blind sides, anybody who still feels safe is a fool. James, on your way out, want medical to look at your finger. James hurt his finger. He got it looked at, and I guess the infection is really, really close to the joint, which can lead to permanent problems. Oh my God, James. I was just walking through the night with no light, and I just ate it <laughs> really, really bad, like the worst fall I've ever had. And I hurt my knee. I know this is bad because I am a nurse, but that's two less people I have to fight against for a million dollars. This is just so oh, puppy. So Number two. Number three was amusing, this one is just silly. The theory is that Mike White, the runner-up of season 37, David vs. Goliath, was potentially going to be disqualified at the live finale of this season after it was reported that he snuck THC marijuana pills onto the season and used them to gain an advantage. Did the wine help wash away the guilt, Mike? Apparently the advantage was stress relief and it would allow him to sleep easier at night. He would probably also enjoy any food rewards a little more. Can never have enough Applebee's. And so the theory continues continued that Mike was going to be revealed as the winner because, of course, he received the most votes, but due to his alleged cheating, was instead going to have the votes revoked and either the player with the next most votes would win, which I guess would have been Nick, or the producers would have held a live revote. Yeah. What? This theory started online from a source with a somewhat reliable history of getting it right. Even Russell Hance, a former player, stated that it was true. But then, if you paid attention, come the live finale, and none of this happened, Nick received more votes, was rightly crowned the winner, and every juror went on postseason to explain their vote without any idea what this rumor was about. There was nothing fishy at all, and I am left to believe it's totally bogus. The winner, Survivor, <laughs> David. In some ways, you're kind of the polar opposite. I mean, you, you coming into this game, you 
<laughs> well, meaning this. Number one, call me Charlie Day. This is the Mac Daddy of all survivor conspiracy theories, just like the previous one. This one is not only totally not real, but also so absurd that I actually enjoy pondering what kind of world we would live in if it were true. Season 20. Heroes versus villains. In episode six, Banana Etiquette, we see a foolproof split vote plan get concocted to take out the one and only Russell Hans. Russell stands up at tribal council and plays his idol on poverty, his number one ally, likely taking a bullet for her. But instead, the votes come in and Tyson randomly comes away with the most votes. Despite Russell's alliance being down six to three in numbers with a foolproof three to three to three split vote incoming against him, Tyson ends up switching his vote at the last second, voting for Parvati. All the votes against her are then negated by Russell's idol, and Tyson is hoisted by his own petard. Essentially, Tyson votes himself out. Russell, the latest golden goose of the Survivor producers, and WrestleMania, all that buzz, stays alive for one more round. In the next episode, we see Boston Rob meagerly attempt to sway Coach to his side, and then we see Coach throw his vote away to prevent a tie from occurring, thus ensuring Boston Rob is voted out, despite Coach not wanting Rob to leave. And then Russell blindsides Coach in the episode after that. A lot of bad gameplay is on display here. What's the deal? The deal, the conspiracy theory, is that all three of Tyson, Rob, and Coach were approached by the producers to throw away their games, to allow Russell to survive a little longer because he was the new it boy in the survivor world and the producers wanted to ride that ratings train until the wheels fell off. And to add another layer, in return, Rob, Coach, and Tyson would each get invited back and be gifted a season for them to win. Each of their seasons would even feature a safety net, Redemption Island, in the event that things got wonky. And what do you know? Two seasons later, Rob returns and wins. Seven seasons later, Tyson returns and wins. And three seasons later, Coach returns and, well, he almost won. But if all of that wasn't enough, even more than that, the theory goes on to suggest that at the merge of Coach's season South Pacific, a player named Cochran was approached by the producers with the same sweet deal. If he flipped on his original tribe and joined Coach's tribe to give Coach the numbers and a much higher chance of winning, Cochran would also be gifted a season in the near future. So Cochran flipped and returned three seasons later and won that season. Dear God. <laughs> The power of Russell Hans cannot be quantified. Or more likely, there is just a noticeable, obvious experiential advantage when you play Survivor for a second or third or fourth time, especially when you play against newbies and you're not all that bad of a player, and luck happens to break your way. This is a joke of a conspiracy theory, but it is so absurd. If you take Mike's THC pills, it just might begin to make sense. I am so glad I learned how to make a tinfoil hat. Oh man, I have nobody to blame but myself. I was the victim of my own stupidity. What you gonna do? I'm still pretty awesome. I mean, I saw it coming tonight. It's tough, you know, I wish coach would have kept his word. I pretty much knew that he was going to do what he thought was in his best interest. I never thought that I would be going out so soon. I had so much that I wanted to accomplish. And you know, I really am not a very vindictive person, but I hope they get wiped off the face of the map. And those are the most bizarre conspiracy theories in Survivor. It's a lot. And if this is your first time ever hearing about this stuff, welcome to a new reality. Don't worry, it's not that bad here. They have free soft serve. Regardless, I hope you guys enjoyed the vid. I hope that you don't actually believe any of this stuff. Let me know what you think, if there's anything else I should maybe cover in the future. As always, I want to give a huge thank you to my patrons for not drinking that cherry Kool-Aid. Don't forget to get on the good side of the producers on your way out, and I will see you in the next one once I figure out that, oh my god, Pepe Silvia is real. I've stumbled onto a major company conspiracy, Mac. How about that for stress? Pepe Silvia, this name keeps coming up over and over again. Every day, Pepe's mail's getting sent back to me. Pepe Silvia, Pepe Silvia. So I go up to Pepe's office and what do I find out, Mac? What do I find out? There is no Pepe Silvia. The man does not exist, okay? So I decide, oh shit, buddy. I gotta dig a little deeper. There's no Pepe Silvia, you gotta be kidding me. I got boxes full of Pepe. Mac, half the employees in this building have been made up. This office is a goddamn ghost town. Jesus Christ, dude, we are gonna lose our jobs. Well, calm down, because here's one thing that's not gonna happen. What? We're not gonna get fired. We're not, because we've already been fired. You know what, Barney? Give this guy a cigarette. He's freaking out. Barney? Who the hell is Barney? You don't see Barney? Oh, shit. You've lost your mind. You've lost your goddamn mind, Charlie. <laughs>